Welcome to the Diversity Pivot Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Kratz. I am thrilled you are here with us today. Our purpose is to share stories, ideas, and tools to help you on your diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. Let's meet this week's guest. Welcome listeners. Uh, We have a very special guest this week. Kenji Joshino is the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law and Director of the Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. He's a graduate of Harvard, Oxford, and he specializes in constitutional law, anti-discriminational law, and literature. He received tenure at Yale Law School, where he served as deputy dean before moving to NYU. He's published a lot of great stuff over the years. I've had a chance to see him featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, and he's actually just written his fourth book while he's joining us today that he co-authored with David Glasgow. And it's called Say the Right Thing, How to Talk About Identity, Diversity, and Justice. He's also served as president of the Harvard Board of Overseers and currently serves as the board of the Berman Center for Justice on advisory boards for diversity and inclusion for Morgan Stanley and Charter Communications and on the board of his children's school. Oh, that touches my heart. And he's won numerous awards for teaching and scholarship. And he lives in Manhattan with his husband, two children, and the great dame as well. Uh, Kenji, welcome to the show. Long-term fan. It's so, so wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. It's really a delight to be here. Ah, well, let's start with Say the Right Thing. Um, and really, actually, before we get into the new book, um, let's share your diversity story. How did you get into diversity work? And you co-founded uh, this wonderful institution as well at NYU. So I'd love to just hear the backstory on how that all came to be. Yes, it's a great question because I think oftentimes people do not think of DNI as being populated by lawyers, which both I and my co-author, who happens to be the executive director of the center that you just mentioned, the Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, are. But uh, I actually view this to be a story of much more continuity than rupture. You know, I sort of grew up, you know, cutting my teeth as a civil rights guy. Uh, I went to law school in order to think about sort of LGBTQ plus, you know, equality issues, uh, decided to become an academic, but wrote, you know, through tenure, uh, almost exclusively on LGBTQ plus rights uh, within the law. Uh, So I'm older, right? So this is a time period in the 1990s and onward when, you know, the ice was finally breaking up in this area of the law where... You know, we had the Romer case uh, in 1996, uh, which, you know, for the first time struck down a law that was uh, discriminatory against gay people. And then in 2003, Lawrence versus Texas, the Brown v. Board of the gay rights movement, and then so on and so forth. But um, as I sort of got to the end of that arc, in a way, with same-sex marriage in 2015, I was thinking like, oh, what is the next frontier? So is it that I pursue these issues, you know, globally, because in 70 countries, you know, same-sex sexual activity is still criminalized. Is it that I move into a different area that I think of as, you know, needing my attention? Um, And what I came to realize, Julie, was that I had all the same commitments towards inclusion, but particularly after I wrote my first book, I became a little bit leery about how much law could fully kind of deliver on those Uh, objectives, because law is really, really good at sort of doing things that are kind of require a lot of brute force. Law is kind of a meat axe, if you will, uh, and it can come in and be very, very forceful. So, you know, if it's like, you know, making sure same-sex marriage is the law of the land, there's really no way but, you know, through litigation and scholarship and legislation that you could achieve that. But if it's something like, you know, is there a second generation form of discrimination that gay people or really any historically subordinated or equity deserving group is encountering, is law really going to be the answer to that, right? So I might be able to bring a lawsuit if a colleague of mine tells me to be more straight acting, right? But am I really going to spend five years of my life doing that? You know, am I really going to say, you know, I'm just going to challenge this um, uh, legally? Or or am I just going to say, I'm either going to challenge this not at all, or I'm going to challenge this culturally? So more and more, I just saw law as like the floor over which we had to build and the cultural work of building above that floor. The most interesting people who were doing that were DNI folks, right? So 
I got really passionate about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging and accessibility. And um, six years ago now, it's hard to believe time has flown so fast. Uh, my executive director and co-author of this book, David Glasgow, and I co-founded a center on diversity, inclusion, and belonging here at NYU Law. And we just got endowed last year as the Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah, what a cool story. And and you've been writing books about diversity for some time. How I got introduced to your work was through a mutual ally and colleague of ours, Jennifer Brown, um, whose podcast you've been on many times. And we're always happy to send people a will to change is a great podcast out there for DEI. And she interviewed you about covering, I think it was when you were first starting into officially into the DEI space. So that work has been just tremendous. And the latest work, um, Say the Right Thing, you know, going from a uh, a cancel culture to a coaching culture, I know is something you're really passionate about, especially at this moment in time. When I got to think, Kenji, you've probably been writing this book and putting it together for years, but it, what a time for it to come out when we're so polarized and we're so willing just to say somebody's a bad person because they made one mistake and what a mistake that could be for all of us. Tell us more about the inspiration for this latest book. Yeah, again, thank you for the question. Uh, so, you know, we started writing this book because so many people came to us and just said, I want to be an ally, but I'm terrified that I'm going to say the wrong thing. And I'm terrified they're going to hurt someone I care about, but I'm also terrified that I'm going to get canceled and suffer some punishment. And so therefore, I'm not going to step into the allyship space at all because the better you know, more self-protective course for me is going to be just silence, right? And as you and I both know, Julie, you know, that silence is no longer really being construed as neutrality, right? It's being construed as complicity in an unjust status quo, right? So, you know, I think those individuals who remain silent feel the costs of their silence, but they think that the costs of getting canceled are so much greater. And so when we looked at that, you know, David and I both thought, you know, it's not that we have this kind of unnuanced view of cancel culture, right? We, we do think that cancel culture can be appropriate in certain circumstances, so that if someone is a repeat offender and is engaged in egregious behavior and doesn't want to get better, then, you know, we're not, you know, saying that cancellation is never appropriate for that kind of a person. But that's really not the vast majority of us. The vast majority of people we encounter, even people who are skeptics of the DNI project, you know, are people of goodwill who are trying to get better, but who are just not being given the tools to do that. So our two complaints about cancel culture, are first, that is so indiscriminately punitive, and it just goes from zero to 60 so quickly. And then the other one is that it doesn't really offer any practical tools to help anyone get better. So you're just sort of calling somebody out and then casting them out into the outer darkness without actually saying, you know, here's how to get better. And you know, in our lives, we've learned the most when, you know, we've made mistakes and then some friendly coach has come to us and said to us, like, I'm going to hold you to really high standards, but I'm going to be with you every step of the way as you try to meet those standards. And we thought, why wouldn't we offer that in the DNI context as well? So the book is quite different from other books that I've written. It's very, very tactical. It's a bit of like a screwdriver or a multi-tool rather than like some high concept book. But it really is trying to meet this notion of uh, the reader where they are. of just saying, I want to do the right thing, but I'm terrified that I'm going to pay a kind of inordinately high price for trying to do the right thing. And mm -hmm. just saying, no, 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 you're not. Like, we're here to coach you. Like, let this book be your friend, right? To coach you through these seven principles of, you know, how to have these identity conversations so that we can, you know, entice you, if you will, to, to step into the the place of allyship. So the book as a whole is kind of animated by this desire to move more broadly. You know, I've talked a little bit about what our motivations were in talking to individuals, but more broadly at the cultural level, it's trying to intervene and saying, wouldn't we all be better off if we move from at least an emphasis, like an emphasis on cancel culture to an emphasis on coaching culture? Yeah. Yeah. So true. I mean, you think about, I think about my childhood experiences, making mistakes, I learned not to make that same mistake again through someone coaching me. I mean, why would we just write somebody off for making one mistake when that's how our brains learn and grow to be better? So I agree. And, and I'd love that you use the scale in your book. So I think this is something that's missing because when I 
talk about this, especially being a white person in allyship work, I have to be really careful because I, I know how it can come across as like, oh, great. Now you want to forgive everybody that's like done all this terrible, racist, sexist, fill in the blank behavior. It's like, no, there's a there's a, a process, a, a scale as you have in the book. And I, I love how you labeled it red, yellow, <laughs> green. Like there are some things that just are a little nuanced that people just maybe a little need a little tweak on, right? We adjust our coaching approach. There's some things more yellow where it's like, it's probably a tremendous learning opportunity. And then you got the red where this may be so egregious or repeat behavior that maybe they don't want to get it. But we know that's such a small percentage of people. Most people want to get it. They just don't get it yet. So those yellow episodes are real opportunities for your coaching model. Um, tell us more about how you came up with that scale. Maybe give our listeners some context around how that might work. Yeah, absolutely. So we just, uh, this is in our chapter on disagreements. And the chapter on disagreements really begins with a kind of heartbreaking story, Julie, of a student of ours who came to us and said, like, as a man, you know, I made a comment at, you know, your last, you know, meeting uh, for the center. And then a female colleague of mine said to me, oh, I think you're being sexist. And I didn't think I was, but am I allowed to disagree if I'm a man and she's a woman? And it broke our hearts because like, you know, on the one hand, like we're an institution of higher learning. Of course, you should be allowed to disagree. Like if not here, where, right? Um, but also like, you know, our heart broke in a, in, a, in a better way, like in a more positive way, because um, this guy was being so thoughtful, you know, and saying like, I actually worry about this disagreement because, I may not know stuff, right, just because of my life experience. So I really need to be humble, right, about the way I approach this, right? And so what, in thinking about this, we thought, like, we definitely want people to be able to disagree. Like, if the only options are, like, remain silent or, like, roll over, then no one's going to want to be, like, an ally for very long, right? So sometimes they have to just be able to disagree and say, I don't think that's right, you know, but, you know, even on an issue of identity or DNI. But then when we delve more deeply into it, we realize that like there are disagreements and there are disagreements, right? So, and we mean that in two kinds of ways. One is at the cultural level where, and this is where your traffic light coding of red, green, uh, yellow, you know, comes in uh, or your reference to our traffic light coding, I should say. Um, so, you know, there are certain issues that we think of as just being in the red zone where you basically shouldn't, right, think that you can disagree about them and get, you know, any kind of traction, right? So there are things that we have settled in society so long ago. So the example that we give are, you know, people on the far, 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 far right who say, like, you know, women should not be allowed to stand for public office, right? And it's just sort of like, that demeans all of us to have that conversation. I'm not even going to step into that. We resolved this, like, centuries ago, right? So maybe if we were in like the, you know, 19th century, that would be an okay conversation to have. Which some people may want to go back to. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in 2023, like, no, we're just not going there, right? And then we thought at the opposite extreme, there are these green conversations, right? Where if you and I staying on the gender issue, like, are having a disagreement about whether gender quotas are appropriate, right? We think that that is fully on the table because you could actually be a total progressive and think like, you know, gender quotas do more harm than good. And then we would have a debate about what other countries have done, what quotas have done, and why our own country has an allergy to quotas that's based on race, right? Uh, because race is our foundational example of, you know, civil rights and inclusion. And that may actually have, you know, skewed the way we think about quotas more generally, right? So I think that's a green disagreement, meaning that, you know, have at it, like, and then in the middle are the more complicated ones where it's like, ah, oh, this may be sort of, sort of, you know, fading into the red zone. Like, and so, or, or to carry the metaphor of the traffic light, you know, you're looking at the yellow light and you're thinking like, oh, can I make this light before it turns red? Right. And so if you think you can, you know, go for it, but go for it with eyes open, right. That this is in the yellow zone. So a yellow zone disagreement might be like something along the lines of, are there any innate characteristics, right, that uh, differentiate men versus women uh, that might bear on, you know, psychology, right, or the workplace, right? So do we believe that, you know, as James Damore said in his infamous Google memo, right, you know, that, you know, men are just going to be better at math at the very, very extreme edges, right, of performance, right? So, uh, well, maybe it's not obvious, but I obviously don't subscribe to that view, um, but, you know, uh, it's, I, I think it's not green. It's probably not as, 
read, you know, as we would wish it to be, right? And so it's like, maybe it's useful to have that debate, maybe it's not, right? So I'm on the fence as to whether or not this is a useful debate to have, right? Um, my general thought on this, by the way, is like, you know, there's so much, you know, um, gender stereotyping in society that I would really like to, you know, as Catherine McKinnon once said to my colleague, Carol Gilligan, like, we'll know whether women speak in a different voice once, you know, the patriarchy takes its foot off of their throats, right? So it's like, I think we're in conditions of inequality. So it's maybe not be useful uh, to engage in this inquiry until we have more gender equality as a so social matter to figure out whether or not women would choose you know, different professions or different uh, ways of life or um, uh, things like that. Uh, so yeah. I hope that's helpful, right? And sort of laying out the landscape of like their disagreements and disagreements. But then the real innovation, and then I, I have to give my colleague David Glasgow for this, is more at the kind of retail level of the individual of saying like, there's yet another scale of like mm -hmm. when you've actually decided to have the conversation. Why is it that even when we think we're in the green zone or maybe even in the yellow zone, these conversations can go sideways so easily? And his answer is, again, there are disagreements and disagreements. But this time the scale goes from like disagreements over tastes to disagreements over facts to disagreements over policies, disagreements over values, all the way over to disagreements over equal humanity. And what he points out is that if you and I were to disagree, Julie, about which like, you know, Netflix show is the best or which sports team is the best, like that would be banter. That would be very friendly, I think. Right. Uh, so disagreements over taste tend to be non-inflammatory. Right. And we move over to facts again, not kind of fights over values by proxy, like alternative facts, but like who, what, when, where, why, sort of journalistic facts. Again, we might disagree a little bit more heatedly, but it's not likely to get out of control. Mm -hmm. When it goes to policies or values, that hits at our core more. And then over at the very, very kind of right uh, is equal humanity. So that, you know, if you say something that I feel like strikes at my equal humanity, then I may not be able to sustain, you know, a respectful disagreement because it just seems like demeaning for me to even participate in the disagreement. Mm -hmm. And what we found people missed each other was that when one side thought they were having a conversation about facts and values, and then the other side thought that they were having a conversation about their equal humanity, and neither side could see where the other side was coming from. And so mm -hmm. our advice is you don't have to right go to where the other person is. In fact, that's often impossible to do just based on your own life experience. But you know, acknowledge that it might have that salience for them. So I think examples always help. My example here is like when prior to 2015, when I was doing the rounds of the constitutional law circuit, like talking about, you know, why same-sex marriage should be legally recognized. I constantly was in green room after green room, prep call after prep call, where folks said, we know you're in a same-sex relationship and this might be personal for you, but please don't bring that up, right, in this debate. Like, we want you to have this debate as an issue of policy, right, and of facts, uh, rather than, you know, adverting to your own personal experience, because we think that's kind of unfair, right? And I thought, wow, like, of course, I'm a constitutional law professor. I'm not just going to stand up on a stage and talk about my feelings. Like, I have arguments, and I feel like I have the stronger arguments. But I did feel like, goodness, like you could have done yourself so much good. And I don't think would have deprived yourself of any argument if you've just been able to say, like, we realize that we're arguing this is a matter of, you know, facts and policies. And you know, whereas for you, these might land as issues of equal humanity because they're really about your sense of belonging and the polity. And we'll try to be mindful of that as we have this conversation. But if we ever sort of go over the line, let us know. It's such a different intersubjective recognition of where I'm coming from. Such a subtle and, reframe, but an important one, rather than being awesome. told you can't talk about a huge part of your identity in life. Yeah. Well, and, and the irony too, is you wrote a book about covering and having to minimize or maximize or hide, uh, you know, whether that's being out in the workplace or out in an interview. And that is an example of when someone's forcing you to cover uh, too. So, so many, so many dimensions at play here. Kenji, um, one of the other things that I really liked about the book was about apologies. And it's so fun when you meet a kindred spirit in this space, because Harriet Lerner, uh, you had Loretta J. Ross, you had Renee Brown stuff in there. And I'm like, yes, these are like the thought leaders that all talk around this. But I'd never seen an apology framework like yours with the four R's that really spoke to me as something that was really like you said, like a screwdriver, it's like something I could pull out and use in the moment when I stumble and bumble, because I say that a lot, like I make mistakes. I've made 
two mistakes in the last six months on social media where I've chosen not to take the post down and add an edit because I learned from the feedback I got and I wanted other people to learn from the experience. I study this stuff and I get it wrong sometimes. And I think we need to have forgiveness for people as long as you own it. But apologies go south real quick because it's like, you know, the ifs, the buts, you know, you have all these uh, great words that you use to describe why they don't land. But people think they're apologizing and it's still not enough, right? So when you make a mistake, as hopeful allies, everyone will. Um, It's about how do you apologize in a very meaningfully respectful way. But walk us through that framework and maybe give us an example of how to craft a good apology. Absolutely. So um, so first, to make sure that uh, you're not hanging out alone out there, I will say that I, too, you know, study this stuff and I, too, make mistakes constantly. So I sort of feel like if you're not making mistakes, you're not doing it right, you know, which means that we have to uh, learn how to apologize uh, when we get things wrong. So your four R's uh, or the four R's that you mentioned are, uh, first of all, recognition, second of all, responsibility, third, remorse, and fourth, redress. So quite quickly, right, uh, with regard to uh, recognition, we wanna make sure that we're fully recognizing the harm that was done. You know, oftentimes people say, you know, if I did it, I'm sorry, or I'm sorry if you feel that way. And so as you noted, like if is a real kind of danger word, right, that would signal that you may be uh, under recognizing the harm. If you're genuinely uncertain, then exercise curiosity and figure out, you know, whether you did it or not. But Generally, you do know what you did and what you're trying to do is to evade full accountability for it and sort of hedge by saying, if I did it, I'm sorry. Uh, So beware of that, you know, fully own what you did. Uh, The next one is to uh, take uh, responsibility for what you did. And the danger word here is but, right? I'm sorry, comma, but I was having a miserable day. Whereas you might think, well, Kenji, what happens next time you have a miserable day? Are you going to repeat the same bad behavior, right? So you know, it's perfectly fine to say, like, I'm sorry, period, you know, there's no excuse, period, right, rather than trying to sort of, you know, go on and provide some kind of uh, insight into why you did what you did. You know, my favorite example here is Roseanne Barr's, like, I'm sorry, I sent out that racist tweet, comma, but, you know, it was 2 a.m. and I was ambient tweeting, and Sanofi, the maker of Ambient, had to tweet out, right, its own sort of commentary that, you know, racism is not a side effect of any Sanofi product, right? So I love that cheeky response, too. Yeah. That's like such a great way to respond to something like that. But yeah, it's very arch. Yeah. Yeah. And but then, your real life examples, Kenji, too, I just wanted to point out in the book, I love how you use real life col- pop culture examples, everyday examples, but the stories are so beautifully researched that you cite as well, which I loved the application. Thank you so much. Uh, we 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 have a lot of. I want to give props to our student researchers who were incredibly wonderful and sort of vacuuming up every example of apology, you know, under the sun, uh, but also sort of keeping us uh, hopefully a little bit more hip and current than we otherwise would be. Um, so the third one is remorse, and we don't really think that there are kind of buzzwords here, like if or but. It's more like context factors of like showing that you're authentically sorry for what you did. And oftentimes um, the context can betray you and show that you didn't really mean what you did. And in those instances, we really want to encourage people to offer a respectful disagreement rather than an inauthentic apology. So our example here is uh, Mario Batali, the celebrity chef who was accused of sexual assault, assault. And he wrote this kind of not great, but passable apology. And then added like as a postscript, you know, uh, and for those of you who are interested, here's like a festive holiday uh, recipe for cinnamon rolls. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Of like, you've just blown up all the work that you did there because there's no way I'm going to accept that as sincere if you're going to mash it up against, uh, you know, recipe for cinnamon rolls or any recipe for that matter. And then the last one is redress. This is that you can't sort of talk your way out of something that you've acted your way into. So don't think of the apology as being closing the book finally on something like it is a form of closure. I don't want to undersell that. But, you know, an apology is also opening the book on something. It's opening the book to a future course of conduct that doesn't include the bad behavior. Right. Because if I apologize to you and I do the same thing tomorrow, then that apology is worthless. Right. So I really have to commit to a future course of conduct. So it has to be sort of not I'm sorry, period, but I'm sorry. And right, I won't do this again. It's a pledge of future conduct. And to sort of put so a box on this, yeah, Julie, you know, those four R's, like when we were going through this, we were thinking like, why is this so hard for us uh, to do as human beings? And, 
You know, the wisest you know, answers of that came from a physician named Aaron Lazar has written a terrific book on apologies where he says, essentially apologies make us feel excruciatingly vulnerable. So I know when I apologize, so I don't say I was apologizing to you, I would worry that you would pile on or that you might take advantage of me or that you might sort of shame me and I've opened myself up. So I've already admitted my, you know, that I've done something wrong. So I'm very, very exposed, right? And he says these kind of hedges like if or but, right? Or, you know, sort of softening the remorse that we feel or trying to treat this as like, if it's done and dusted, why are we still talking about this when I apologize, right? All of those hedges that fail the four R's are just attempts to protect ourselves. And what he says is, when you try to, that's a very human impulse. It's a lovely kind of humane view that he offers. He says, it's a really human response, but be careful because it's not a productive one. Because in fact, you will succeed at neither objective if you had your apology in that way. You will neither authentically mm -hmm. apologize, nor will you genuinely protect yourself because the person will just reject the apology. And then now you'll have to apologize for having rendered like a half-baked apology, right? You have to apologize more times. Exactly. <laughs> well, and it makes sense. I, I, I When I read that chapter, I, I was thinking more of my personal life too, because professionally, I don't know why it's, it's, it's easier. It's not easy, but it's easier personal life it's like oh you know and you like, uh, just like and I was like oh just, just keep in the professional context Julie because like it is it's like the fear of being ostracized or like outed I think is like a deeply primal human thing because we're meant to survive in groups and so I could see how an apology saying I was wrong could be a cause for being canceled you know to use your words and being out on your own and that was one of the most dangerous things that a human being could have experienced I mean still today loneliness is you know, it's such a sad outcome um, for folks, but yeah, that we're, and I think maybe, you know, for hopeful allies, think about that framework. And, and that's a nice pressure chat test. When you do make a mistake, this is a meaningful way a framework that you can kind of think through. Okay. Did I do these things? Not that it's a checklist, but it gives you some guidance because rarely do you see an apology that fits all of those things. And I really appreciated in the book you had the Tina Fey progression because yeah. I was like, no, I love Tina, not her too. <laughs> and she she does learn from her mistakes and finally has a complete apology um, for something that happened on 30 Rock, I think, uh, a yeah. blackface, yeah. you know, which is like, wow, that happened on that show. I had no idea. So when we make a mistake, um, you know, owning it, um, that recognition, that responsibility, yeah, I really appreciate the remorse, the genuine remorse and the redress because people want to know you're going to be better next time. And that teaches other people how to be better. So maybe they don't have to make the same mistake and go through all this work that you're saving that so that people can learn from your own experience by way of your example. Um, I got to tell you too, Kenji, as much as I've done this work uh, and studied it for so many years, I've used the word ally because I, I couldn't find a better word. This is before it got popular. This is like six, seven years ago when I was writing about men as allies. And I like the word champion. <laughs> Such a silly thing to say because now I'm like, what was I thinking? But I like man champions, like man, men ambassadors. You know, I played it with all these words and everyone kept sending me to this word ally. Well, it wasn't until I read in your book the Latin origin of that word to bind together. And I thought, ah, full circle moment for me of, what does being an ally mean, right? And what does it mean in this dichotomy of cancel versus coaching culture? How do we show up? Um, and so that was just really meaningful for me. And one of the other things I wanted to um, just get your input on is one of the things I think that an ally can do very well is these everyday moments when something's not inclusive or something feels icky, you know, those microaggressions, those covering situations, just how do we call folks in to be better, right? Versus out them and shame and blame them, which we know is not usually going to, to your point, cause a, a, a productive um, behavior reform. And you have a great list in your book of call-in phrases. And I, I really like you and David's personal favorites too. <laughs> My go-to when someone says something weird, I just say weird, like, you know, just something like, what? I was like, what makes you think that? Or like, what? you know, but in the moment, you taught you called it an escalator blip. Is it an escalator? I think we call it a staircase thought or escalator wit. I think. wit. Yes, that's what it is. It's like you freeze, you don't say anything, and then like five seconds, you're like, I have the perfect thing to say. So could you walk us through some of those back pocket phrases when someone does have a bumble and stumble? This is more of a 
Yeah, more I would put this in the more of the microaggression zone, probably that yellow part of uh, maybe even green part of your barometer there. But when someone does make a mistake, how can we be an ally and call them in? Yeah, so absolutely. So thank you for uh, for that commentary on, on ally as well. Uh, but you know, moving to this point, you know, we we really generally generally at our center don't like scripts because we think these are human interactions are so nuanced and fine grained. Like we would be foolish like to think that it could be resolved with a script even though one CEO after another just says like give me a script and I'll read it you know just tell me what to say and it's like it doesn't really work like that right but most common question I get just tell me what to say or do I'm like I can't do the work for you you need to think too but I, I get you yeah but the the one place where we felt like we could make an exception was exactly this one that you were talking about which is you know you're in a large meeting we've I think all been in the situation where someone makes a, like a wildly inappropriate comment and you're like, oh, I really need to speak up. But two things impede at least me from doing it. You know, one is that it's very time pressured. So like, you know, I got to get it out, you know, before the meeting ends, because then we'll all disperse and I can't have like one on one conversations with the 200 people in the meeting. So I really got to get it done. Uh, but then the other one is, you know, it's not just the clock is ticking, but that if I say the wrong thing, it could really be adversary, right? That, you know, I am sort of criticizing somebody else's comment, right? And so how do I do that in a way that sort of doesn't put their back up? So I'm very sort of careful about trying to find the right form of words. But as I do, just as you said, the clock runs out, we all disperse, and I think of exactly the right thing to say, what the French call the pensée de l'escalier, the staircase thought. Not in the room where it matters, but in the staircase outside of the room. There's a whole Seinfeld episode based on this, right? Where George could stand so I think so exactly the right comeback. Oh, that's so good. I mean, it's so yeah. practical. Like this happens a lot to people. Yeah. And so we provide a list. We're like, we're gonna bend our rule and just give you a list. And so here's some strategies in terms of like saying something short and sharp, right? So I personally can't imagine doing that, but I've seen other people use it to really good effect of saying like, ouch or yikes or excuse me. And it's probably like, you know, I don't know whether this is to my credit or discredit, probably my discredit, but it's like, I'm just not that bold, right? Like I'm not that confrontational a person. So I like, you know, look down our own list and I go to something like educate, unsurprisingly as a professor, I say like, I see things differently, you know, could I explain my perspective, right? Or there's another one that I love that is very Loretta Ross that says, you know, affirm the person before you criticize the conduct, right? So I really believe that you're an inclusive person, period, right? That's why what you just said really surprised me, or therefore I was surprised, you know, when that comment came out of your mouth, right? And so that kind of primes people's egalitarian self-conception. It sort of lowers their identity threat, right? Because, you know, you're not saying they're a terrible person. To the contrary, you're saying they're a great person. And then you're calling out the conduct as being inconsistent with that. Um, with that, uh, with the nature of the person that you're describing. So we have a sort of laundry list of strategies and then some examples of each strategy. And the, the thought is not choose the ones we chose. Like to the contrary, it's like choose the ones that work for you and that would feel authentic coming out of your own mouth. We're diverse with regard to our temperaments as with everything else. But the kind of challenge is, you know, it doesn't matter which two, but like find two responses on this list that would feel natural coming out of your mouth, memorize them, put them in your back pocket, because the likelihood that you'll be able to play those cards on the table is much greater, right? If you have them ready to go, right, in your back pocket, right, so that you can play the card in the room where it matters, rather than, you know, waiting in until you hit the staircase outside that room. Yeah, yeah, so good. Yeah, and, and I love the authenticity, because you're not going to have the book in front of you to read. I even thought about printing out that chart, like having it somewhere. And I thought, no, to your point, these need to be things that feel genuine to who we are and to be use even vocabulary that you're comfortable with, because people are going to notice like, oh, gosh, what's she? <laughs> where'd that come from? So it has to be yours. But because we do get kind of hijacked in those moments and our amygdala is likely firing because we're just so thrown off by what somebody said, especially if it's somebody that you know to be a good person, which they probably are, they just made a mistake. We're thrown and we don't know what to say or do. Um, so I, I always appreciate those phrases to use in the moment. And if, if all else fails, allies, the circle back, right? You can't circle back to 200 people in the room, but you can certainly circle back to the person if their behavior went unchecked to say, hey, Let's talk about that more. I want to dig into what happened the other day. 
um, and make sure that they're held accountable because letting somebody off the hook is letting them do it again too. Um, Kenji, this has been so fun to talk with you. I, I did want to ask you one, you know, g- a question, just knowing you've been in this work for a long time and what I appreciate about your book, it's individual actions, but also the idea that we need their systems need to change, right? Our systems. And it is where we're at in the DA space is how do we get individuals to shift behavior while changing the systems, which individuals operate in. And you're, you're doing that both right with law and with this book, what do you wish for? You know, if you could wave a magic wand in the DEI space was somehow better, what would make it better? What would you wish for to change? Wow. Um, so many things, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the one that I'll focus on is um, just the legal landscape that we're facing. So ironically, sort of my career is coming full circle where, you know, I started in law and then I kind of moved an emphasis away from the law into D- DEI because I really felt like law is the floor and DEI is the kind of culture that we build above that floor to get the same kind of civil rights type commitments that we have in law sort of accomplished, right, of inclusion and what have you, right? But, you know, with legal developments like the pending Supreme Court affirmative action case, you know, other pieces of legislation that are um, kind of erupting all around the country, like the Stop Woke Act in Florida or the anti-CRT initiatives, you know, that are popping up, you know, in school districts, you know, around the nation, like laws no longer like, you know, the floor, it's like the ceiling that threatens to crush DEI, right? And so, you know, if I, so a weird thing about our center is that we're now much more like relevant as a DEI center that operates out of a law school, right? Because the law is getting involved again, right, in DEI and is not, you know, being neutral with regards to DEI initiatives. And so if I wish one thing would change, it would be like that the legal impediments to DEI that I see sort of looming on the horizon could be countered, right? And that more people were who work in the space were mindful about the fact that, you know, there are going to be serious legal constraints on what we can do, you know, unless we kind of wake up and mobilize now about it. And so that would be my sort of call to action and the thing that I would wish could change. Well said. Well said. These are the things that keep me up at night and um, it's affecting our children, which, you know, having children as well, it just seems deeply unacceptable um, to be going back in time at a time when we need to move forward. So yeah, it's the, it's the floor and the ceiling, the laws for now. Um, And got to remain hopeful about the future about being realistic about what is happening. And now more than ever, we need people using their voices to advocate and to to speak into these issues and to vote um, and to follow uh, the great work you're doing and support the centers around the country that are on the positive side of things. So Kenji, it has been wonderful to be with you. Tell our listeners how they can stay in touch with you. Oh, um, yes. So, um, I think that the best way to stay in touch with me is either sort of hit me up on LinkedIn. I do actually connect with people individually. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Kenji underscore Yoshino, uh, or you can go to my website or my center's re- website. So my personal website is KenjiYoshino.com. And then if you just type in Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, you'll come to the Meltzer Center website. Awesome. We'll link to both of those in the show notes. And uh Wow. What what an amazing opportunity to talk with you today. I so appreciate your voice in this world. Thanks, Kenji, for the time. Thank you so much. It was a really, um, it was a real delight to be with you. Such a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like what you heard, consider hiring Julie and the Next Pivot Point team to come speak at your organization's next event. We speak on a range of topics from active allyship to inclusive leadership to how to create a culture where everyone feels seen, heard, and feels a sense of belonging. Thank you for being on this journey with us. Go to nextpivotpoint.com to learn more.